So any the recording just started after a while. So anybody got for some reason got kicked out. I'm not sure what the reason is. Try to log in back, but use your SKU account. Don't use any other account. Use only the SKU account. And apologies yes. for any reason if you got kicked out. Ah, they can't hear you. Uh, for some reason, I can't hear you. Maybe your uh, the connection from your side is bad. So the recording just started. Let's proceed. Uh, let's proceed. So uh, this is, I believe, the slide I stopped last time. So whenever we try to consider seismic waves, it's easier to study what we call rays rather than wave fronts and the relationship actually between the two is that they are perpendicular to each other why ray is not yes, sorry Mahad, what are you saying any problem assume that there is no problem then let's continue so uh, why rays? Rays because they are easier to study, they are easier to track, they are easier to trace back, and that's the reason we study them instead of all the waveforms. So in case if the Earth is homogeneous, it's made of only one velocity, we expect that the wavefront will propagate spherically in all direction in 3D or three-dimensional fashion in all directions and they will be propagating with the same speed and the wavefront will be at the same point at the same distance from the initiation from the source point the reason is being is that the reason is actually uh, because the the velocity is the same the earth is homogeneous which is not true the earth is not homogeneous the velocity is varying the velocity actually increases as we go deeper so uh, the ray path or ray fronts are actually different in each direction. So it's easier then to consider the rays rather than the wave fronts. And again, the most important thing is that we consider the relationship between rays and wave front as orthogonal relationship, or they are basically perpendicular to each other. So if, if uh, what the initial thought by scientists was that the Earth is made up of the same layer, one velocity, so if we send or make uh, a source at a point called A, and there is a receiver at point B, and the distance between a1 to B1 is equal to the distance between B2, A2, A3, B3, A4, and B4. So the travel time going to be the same. The travel time going to be the same. The travel time is dependent in this case to what we call epicentral angle. That's the epicentral angle. Delta 1 is actually the epicentral angle. For all these four cases, the epicentral angle is the same. So the travel time from one point, from A, whatever uh, the subscript is, one, two, or three, to B, one, two, or three. So it's gonna be the same, actually. Uh, maybe, just close the door, sorry. I'm, I'm in lecture right now, I can't help you. I can't, sorry, close the door. Sorry, that's the problem. I should have, let me just go back and lock the door. It's asking me to sign something. I'm not sure why should I sign. <laughs> Sorry about these interruptions. So again, um, the travel time is basically the same. And we, if we increase the distance, the travel time will only increase, but stay the same from 
uh, each pair, C1, A1 to C1, A2 to C2, and so on. But this is not true. We know that the Earth is not made up of only one velocity. The, e the, if the velocity of the Earth is varying. The Earth is made up of different layers. And usually we assume that each layer has one single velocity. That's also an assumption which is not totally true. But in large scale, in global seismological scale, this is this assumption is still valid. The assumption that the Earth is made up of different layers and the velocity of each layer is almost the same, that assumption is valid. And based on that assumption, actually, people determined or the scientists determined what are the number of layers within the Earth. So this is actually the, the, the data they gathered and concluded that the Earth is made up of crust, mantle, inner core, outer core, based on seismological data, based on what we call ray tracing, based on what we studied last time, what we call uh, Snell's law. So we'll investigate Snell's law in much more detail to, for today. And we'll take some examples, and we discuss also seismic phases, how seismic waves travel from one point to another point within the interior of the Earth, and why we call them different phases. We call them different phases because they travel in different paths. They uh, propagate in different layers of the subsurface. So uh, if the Earth is having different layers and the velocity of the earth is increasing as we go deeper the actual travel times between different pairs of source and receiver s is a source a b c are the receivers and what we are doing we are increasing the epicentral angle what we call the epicentral angle is getting increased so what we observe we will not observe a linear curve so this is the distance the distance is increasing the time will increase basically the time will increase if we increase the distance between a source and the receiver and because there is a lot of earthquakes and sometimes we know exactly where the earthquake happens and on the surface of the earth people or organizations, they planted or established a lot of seismic stations. For example, in Oman, we have very precise seismic stations around the Oman, around whole Oman. And the total number of these stations is 20. So they keep recording any earthquake, even if the size of this earthquake is not sensible by humans. The large earthquakes, which happens in, for example, let's assume Japan or other place, they get recorded as well in Oman. The travel time of different earthquakes is based on their distance from the source or from the, from the receiver as well, or the, the distance from source to receiver. And this travel time is a curved shape. It's having a curved shape. That's what we see rather than a linear shape. It's not a linear shape. The reason being the Earth is not homogeneous. The velocity is increasing with dip. So how I can tell if the velocity is increasing or not based on this relationship? That's time. This is the distance. The, the basic answer or simplest answer is that we, cons we consider the slope. If we take a line, the gentler the slope, it means the higher the velocity. The steeper the slope, the lower the velocity. So we have distance, time. Slope is basically what slope is. In this case, we know the slope is change in the change in the y-axis of the change in the x-axis. The, so the slope is the reciprocal or one over the, the velocity. Slope in this case is one over velocity. 
1 over the velocity of any line gives you the slope. We can calculate the velocity if we know the slope. So these lines are actually not straight lines. This is not a straight line. It's a curved line. We'll, we'll know soon why there are even curved lines. Sometimes they get, they become very straight lines. And that will be discussed in the next lecture. So how the wave travels? The wave, as I said, uh, probably one to one section. The other section I couldn't reach to this point. It travels following what we call snail's law. The wave will go straight, will not deflect, refract, or change its path if there is no change in physical property. Again, back to the principle of geophysics, geophysics can be used or analyzed only if there is a change in the physical property. Otherwise, geophysics is almost useless. You cannot, it cannot be used. Uh, frankly, the Earth is not uh, one value, it's uh, changing from one place to another place. So geophysics is usable, it's highly usable to measure these variations. So if we assume that there is an energy arriving and we consider the ray, that's the ray, hitting this interface between two different layers, the velocity of the first layer is four kilometer. The velocity of the second layer is five kilometer. We expect that there gonna be a deflection, a deflection of this energy at the interface. It will not go straight in the same path. It either will be reflected toward the normal, that's the normal, the line perpendicular to the interface, that that's the line we call the normal line. It will either deflect toward or away from the interface. It will refract away, it's deflecting away in this case because the velocity of the second layer is higher than the velocity of the first layer. It's deflecting away. The contrary or the opposite will be true, it will deflect toward the normal if the velocity of the upper layer is higher than the velocity of the lower layer. And how I can tell? I don't need to be genius, I only need to apply this equation. So which theta gonna be larger than the, the, uh, than the other? The incident, this theta, or the refraction? theta, the deflection theta, that's the theta 2. This is theta 2. Which one going to be larger? It dependent on the velocity of the respective layers, the velocity of either upper layer or lower layer. If the velocity of the upper layer is lower than the velocity of the second layer, deeper layer, the ray will be deflected away from the normal. The contrary or the opposite is equally true. If the velocity of the upper layer is higher than the velocity of the second layer, the ray will be deflected toward the normal. In this case, we also get what we call reflection. We will get reflection. And the angle of reflection is always equal to the angle of incident. Muhammad has a question. Uh, yes, doctor, could you please repeat the concept if the velocity of the upper layer is higher, what will happen? The velocity, if the velocity of the upper layer is higher than the velocity of the second layer, deeper layer, and there is an interface, interface between them, the ray will be deflected toward this line, what we call the normal line. And this is all based on what we call Snell's law. So if we apply the Snell's law and we know, for example, one variable is missing only, we know what's the angle of incident. We know, we assume to know that uh, what is the respective velocity of the layers, first and the second layer. We can work out what's the, uh, what we call refraction or transmission angle. We can work out what's the refraction angle. 
it could be larger than the incident angle or smaller than the incident angle based on what based on the velocity of the respective layers if the velocity of the upper layer is lower than the velocity of the lower layer it will be deflected away it will be deflected away from the normal however if the velocity of the upper layer is higher than the velocity of the second layer deeper layer it will be deflected toward so theta theta 2 going to be smaller than theta 1 that's a refraction that's a transmission we will get also what we call a reflection 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 angle is always equal to the angle of incidence for the same ray type is that clear so always whenever there is an incident thing is not as simple as someone can assume no if there is an incident angle of p wave this is a p wave primary wave hitting the interface at an oblique angle at an angle which is not zero that's not zero it has some angle we will have what we call mood conversion mood conversion is what is uh, the principle or the idea that p wave will be also generating s waves or other types of waves so an incident p wave will have four other types of waves this is a p wave hitting the interface we will we will get a transmitted p wave a transmitted a transmitted s wave a reflected t wave and also a reflected s wave this is only true if the ray hits the interface at an oblique angle at an angle which is not zero this angle is not zero so in this simple case we have two different velocity vp v2p v2s these are the velocities of p and s in the lower layer and these are the velocities of uh, vp and vs in the upper layer so there is a mistake this is s v1s uh, i think this is a simple from the from the book itself the mistake is from however we know in general that the p wave is always larger than the s wave p wave is the fastest wave the velocity of p wave is larger than the velocity of s wave that's always true so what i can tell if we apply again the snell's law i can see that the uh, the the refracted p wave will be larger than the incident p wave first of all s wave cannot be easily determined the refracted s wave or transmitted s wave cannot e cannot be easily determined unless you work out the velocities exactly if the velocity of s wave of la lower layer is larger than the velocity of p wave incident p wave it will be larger than the incident wave incident p wave uh, for the case of reflection always the reflection s wave reflection is lower than the the angle of reflection of s wave is lower than the angle of reflection of p wave don't get confused always use the equation if you use the equation properly uh, things gonna be easy to you just use the equation so this is the equation that's the equation how I can get yes Azhar doctor even yes. if the uh, bottom uh, layer has lower velocity the reflected B wave is larger than the incident B wave no no it's gonna be smaller so if the bottom layer has a lower velocity than lower p wave velocity than the upper layer the, the refracted or transmitted p wave will be lower than the incident p wave gonna be lower 
Okay, clear. If they are the same, the ray will not be deflected. It's almost, even if the rocks are different, even if there is one of them is limestone, the other is sandstone, as long as there is no change in velocity, the ray will go straight. There is no mood conversion. Uh, there is no reflection. The reflection only happens whenever there is an interface, a change in velocity between two layers. That's what the Snell's laws state. So if, for example, I'm trying to get, this is, uh, let's assume that this is a P wave, incident P wave. I'm trying to get the refracted S wave, the transmitted S wave. What should I change here? What I want to get the angle of S wave, how it look like. Pen. So how the S wave will look like. How I can calculate it based on this Snell's law. So it will be calculated as such. I know already uh, sine theta 1 going to be sine 37. V1, which is velocity of T wave of the first layer. V1, 4 kilometer per second. Let's assume I know also V2S, that's S wave. Let's assume it's 4.1 or 4.2. Then I can work out what's the this angle, the transmission angle of S wave. It's going to be sine theta, whatever, 3. Let's assume it's 3. This theta is 3. And I divide it by what? V, how much? What the value here? Is 4.2. 4. 4. Not 4, but 4.2. Not 5. This is 5. This is 4 because I'm trying to get the transmission angle of S wave. So I need to know what's the S wave velocity. Is that clear? Uh, you get uh, to do some uh, exercises and things going to be more clear to you. So again, we cover that. What happens if we have a lot of layers? What happens? The same thing, we are just trying to find out the ray path. The velocity we assume is increasing. That's the normal case. Usually, the velocity of subsequent layers is getting larger and larger. So always what happens, the angle of transmission is larger than the, than the angle of incident. Again, the angle of transmission to the third layer is larger than the angle of incident in the second layer, and so on. It goes deflect, deflect away from the normal until it it reaches a point keep deflecting away from the normal because the velocity usually is increasing as we go deeper until it reaches a point and we call that point a turning point so that's the la the deepest point the energy traveled and it starts returning back to the surface starts again returning back to the surface and we record it if we have a sensor located there. So usually they use this principle or Snell's law to trace the energy, to trace the rays where they travel. And they compare their results, their modeling results with the real, the real values they get. And that's how they determine actually what is the internal structure of the Earth? What is the number of layers and what is the velocity of each layer? Because they were using modeling. They modeled the Earth and they compare their results with the observed values. So what I mean by that, so uh, I mean that if I went to the field, I went to the field, uh, let me get a marker. I went to the field, I deployed a source here, and 
get the signal in a receiver here. So that's assume, let's assume that this is two layers, the energy traveled like that, return back. So V1 is velocity of in the first layer is larger than the velocity in the second layer. That's how the energy traveled. But what I record, I only record the travel time. I don't know where the energy traveled. So what I can make, I go back to my computer. I know how SNES law works. I assume that's most important. I make an assumption that the Earth is made up of two layers in this small scale. The Earth is made up of two layers. And I try to model how the rays travels based on SNES law. How the ray will travel based on Snell's law. How much time it takes to arrive back. If I have two layers and the thickness of each layer is one and two, for example, blah and blah, 10 meter, 20 meter, or so on. So I compare my results. If the results are not matching, what I can do, I can update my model. I can update the earth, what I, the guess I made. I either increase the velocities or increase the thicknesses or change the number of layers. And that's how the scientist actually, based on all of these observations, based on all the earthquake data they collected from different stations located around the Earth. In every part of the Earth, there are hundreds and hundreds or thousands of seismic stations recording the earthquakes. They calculate the observed times, they model the Earth based on Snell's law. Using the Snell's law, they model where the rays travel and how much time they take in the interior of the Earth. And they compare the results with what models they have, they, the model or the guesses they make of the Earth. So they started with simple guesses and they keep refi refining the final model until the observations matches the reality until uh, or what we call the observed data they match the calculated the computer data is that clear so this is the snell's law that's the same snell's law what i did i brought this one here and the other one there that's a simple uh, change i made it's still the Snell's law, sign of incident angle over velocity of the first layer, sign of reflection angle, uh, refraction angle or transmission angle divided by velocity of the second layer. That's what we call the Snell's law. But the Earth is not flat. The Earth is a spherical shape. So uh, those two angles are not exactly equal. So if these two lines are parallel, exactly parallel, from, uh, from simple guesses or our own calculation can tell us that these two angles are equal, which will not be true if the Earth is spherical. So to compensate for a spherical shape of the Earth, we make some changes to the Snell's law. We incorporate the radius of the ear at the reflection point. So if we consider this one right now, these two angles, they are no more the same. They are not equal. They are not equal anymore because the ear is spherical rather than a flat ear. So to make the Snell's law still valid, what we do, we incorporate R, the radius of the Earth at the interface point. So R in this case is what is this line from here up until there. This is R1. That's R1. So this angle, sine theta 1, that's sine theta 1, velocity in the first layer, 
will be equated to R2, that's R2. That's R2 times sine of theta 2, that's theta 2. This is theta 2, this is theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, divided by the velocity in this layer V2. This can be also equal to what? R3, which is this one. Sine theta three. That's theta three divided by V three. So this is an important relationship. Actually, it came to many exams, even quizzes, and I saw a surprise that some students couldn't solve it properly. So it's uh, it's as simple as I made this calculation. Uh, it's it's important because it will still make uh, Snell's law valid to use for spherical Earth, and that's how actually they made ray tracing. They traced how the ray passes to the Earth, at what path it takes till it returns back and get recorded in a seismic station somewhere on the Earth surface. So um, if I have different layers, these are different layers, and each layer has specific velocity, what I expect, I expect the velocities or uh, the travel time will decrease as we go deeper. So if I make a plot of epicentral angle or distance between source and receiver, different sources, uh, one source, for example, that's one earthquake source, but different or many receivers. These are many receivers. This is how the rays goes. It depends on the takeoff angle. It goes until it reaches the turning point and return back to the surface. That's another ray, another ray. The larger the takeoff angle is, the deeper it goes. And it gets returns back recorded by some seismic station on the surface. What's important in this case is to determine the number of layers. How we can tell the number of layers, the number of layers can be told or can be recognized based on how many sloops you find. How many different sloops usually you find. So each loop usually gives you one velocity. So what I see, I see that the velocity is increasing, increasing, suddenly increased a lot because the gentler the loop, the larger the velocity. So a line like that, compared to a line like that, which one you think, one or two you think has a higher velocity? One. One has a higher velocity. Because why? It traveled in large distance. It traveled in large distance in very short time. Whereas this one traveled in small distance in very large time. It took large time for this energy to travel small distance. So this loop is representing a higher velocity as we talked about. It becomes more clear when we discuss seismic refraction, the next chapter. The seismic refraction is all based on the principle of determining how many sloops are there, how many lines I can determine. We have a question from Nasser. Yes, Nasser. Uh, doctor, but the velocity, when you have higher velocity, is not depending for the angels, of reflection uh, angels? If they are ref more reflection angles or they take off the angles more, will we have more velocity? It is right or not? No, it's not right. So what is so the you, you you mean that if we have a lot of takeoff angles? Yes. Uh, uh, even so, if you have, there are indefinite number of take takeoff angles. There are so many takeoff angles. 
but I can only make recording at a specific location where I have a station. So I don't have a station here. There is a takeoff angle like that. There is also a takeoff angle like that. But the only problem, I don't have a station in here. So um, what happens if I have, if I assume that I have a station here? So I keep still recording. The line, this line is not actually continuous. It's one, one point here, another point here. So let me delete first everything uh, to make it clear to you. Yes, raise all slides. Um, I'm not recording continuously. I'm not having um, continuous stations. Uh, my stations are at specific distances. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe I have seven stations. So this is just simple representation. It's not the reality. Uh, this is just simplification of the thing. Usually the rays will go in every direction. They go like that. All the ray will propagate in all the directions. I'm considering just few ray paths rather than all the ray paths. So if I add, if I add more, I get a sample here, a sample here, and so on. That's what I get. My point is that where I see straight line, here I see probably straight line. I assume that this is a different layer. This is another layer. This is another layer. This could be another layer. So here I assume that this is one layer. The velocity is straight, a linear in that specific layer. Again here, a different layer. That's the velocity within a specific layer, it's straight. Because we assume that the same layer is uh, having uh, the same geology. So the velocity within that layer is the same. If the velocity within the, the same layer is the same, it will have a linear relationship. It will have almost a linear relationship. Is that clear, uh, Masar? Yes, clear, Doctor. Thank you so much. So again, um, based on all those observations, especially earthquake data, this is the final conclusion and the accepted conclusion the scientists right now have about the number of layers and the velocities of uh, layers within each uh, zone of the Earth. So the, the correct assumption is that the Earth is made up of uh, crust, mantle, inner core, and outer core. And the profile, seismic profiles for P wave and S wave looks like something like what you see here. So this is the distance from the surface of the Earth until the center of the Earth. And this is the velocities. The Y axis is the velocity. So as we move from the crust, the average velocity within the crust of the Earth is about, S-wave, for example, is about 3.7, 3.4 kilometer per second. The P-wave is always larger than the S-wave. And it keeps increasing. So within each zone, I see, for example, within this zone, I see it's linear. It's linear because the velocity is the same, is homogeneous within that specific zone. So that's the crust, the first part. Then, then we have the mantle. Within the mantle, the velocity is increasing. The first part of mantle is a transition zone because we are moving from Athenos to um, another part, harder part, a little bit more ha harder part. And within, within this zone, there is a transition zone. There is small melting. So, the, so in here, some melting happens and the rocks get hardened again. The velocity is increasing. The largest velocity encountered in the Earth is between the core and the mantle. 
the boundary between core and mantle, there we encounter the largest velocity. Within the outer core, this is the outer core, we observe something very interesting. We observe that the velocity decreases a lot. And the S wave velocity becomes how much? What is the S wave velocity in the outer core? What do you think? Zero. 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 Yes, that's true. It's zero. And the reason is that, who can tell me what the reason? Because it's S solid. Wave is zero. Because it's not solid, it's liquid. It's liquid, liquid. yes. It's liquid, and we know with uh, the, the last time that S wave cannot travel in liquid. S wave, the equation of S wave is square root of shear modulus over the density. And shear modulus is zero in liquid. I cannot tear apart water or gas. I can tear apart, maybe tear apart a rock, but I cannot do the same um, because the, the liquid can occupy uh, the shape of the container. It's easily can, without any force, it can easily occupy the shape of the container without me changing its shape, without me requiring to do any force. So the, the outer core outer core is having S wave as zero, whereas P wave will drop a lot. P wave still can travel because P wave has a component of bulk modulus. A rigidity, rigidity modulus is zero, but compressibility modulus, compressibility modulus is what we consider also bulk modulus, how we can compress something, it's bulk modulus. So the liquid can be compressed, gases can be recompressed. So, however, uh, it's of lower velocity. S wave will appear back in the inner core. So that's the S wave. It's appearing as a lower velocity. And also the P wave appears back. This is actually very uh, good reason that we cannot record P waves and S waves everywhere. And that's what we will consider soon or what we call shadow zones. Zones where stations cannot record direct P and S waves. We'll encounter some cases soon on what we call seismic phases. So what are seismic phases? Seismic phases is basically how waves travel in the interior of the Earth. So if this is what we assume a source, an earthquake happened here in the crust, it travels, if it travels as a P wave, May I ask a question? Can Rayleigh wave travel in, in the interior of the Earth? Can surface waves travel in the interior of the Earth? Or what we call love wave? No, they can't yeah. travel. No, yeah, they can't travel. That's the reason we call them surface waves. They only travel here on the surface of the Earth. They can't, rather, Riley and Love Wave, they can't travel in the interior of the Earth. S Wave and P Wave, these can't travel. So if a source, this is not an S Wave, it's a source. Uh, the source is considered in this simple case as an earthquake. If it sends a P Wave, that's a P Wave without going to the core. This is the core. We call it P. We simply call it P, that's a P. If it goes here, hits the surface of the Earth and get reflected back, get recorded here. So let's say that there I have a receiver, R. It's not this straight line. Sorry. Uh, not this straight line. This is what I call P, that's also a P, this is also a P. So it goes like that until it reaches a turning point. Goes deeper 
to reach the turning point and return back to the surface. So this one also have some deflection, but it never hits this boundary between the, the core and the mantle. So this is what we call direct P. This is a direct, directly from source to receiver. Directly from a source to receiver. Whereas the other one, what you see there, PP, it's not a direct. It's not directly from the source. It hit, hit the surface of the earth, returned back. That's a PP. It's called, we call it PP. This is also not that direct because it hit the surface. Again, hit the surface. We couldn't, we didn't record it for some reason. There was no station, but it got recorded here. That's not a direct. This is not a direct P wave. Direct P wave is that one without hitting the surface and returning back. And since there is also a mood conversion, we know that P wave can be at converted to s wave we also receive what we call ps so this is a source it traveled as a p hit the surface of the earth and retained back as an s wave these are what we call seismic phases so we have different phases p phase that's a p phase pp phase it's not a direct but it's a p hitting the surface of the earth getting reflected back, getting recorded by a station somewhere. That's a PS, this is a PS. That's a face, seismic face. Whenever it hits the boundary between the mantle and the core without going in the interior of the core, we call it PCP. So it hit this interface retained back this is a PCC core mantle boundary. It returned back as a P. That's a different phase than PCS. It, that's the source. It went as a P, hit loose. So this hot hit the interface, returned back as an S. Why is returning back as an S? Because there is what we call mood conversion. This is a mood conversion. If it goes in the interior of the, the core itself, <coughs> we call it PKP or P dash. We call it PKP. So the interesting thing is what? If we assume that there is a source, this is half the, of the ear and the rays are moving in every direction, back to the uh, Nasser questions, the rays are traveling in every direction. The takeoff angles are different. We get rays everywhere. After some zoom, after some distance, we cannot record P wave. We cannot record direct P wave. We can record this P wave. This is what we call PP. We can record PP, but PP is not the direct. From this zone up until here, probably, or up until here, we cannot record direct P wave. Why is that? Because if the energy, let's say this is the energy, hit the last energy here, it came hit this interface between mantle and the inner core. What we know, the velocity of the inner core is way lower than the velocity of the mantle. The velocity of the inner core is lower than, very lower than the velocity of the mantle. So this is a line, array. It's in mantle. This is outer core, that's the normal. Where do you think the ray will go? Would it go like that or like that? One or two? 
What do you think, guys? Any more volunteers? Could it go one or two? It goes two. That's true, Matt. Because the velocity of the outer core is way lower than the velocity of the mantle. So it deflects toward the normal. And that's exactly what's happening. This is exactly what happens here. So you see this, and if I draw a line perpendicular to this interface, this is the incident angle, very large. This is transmission angle. It's getting deflected toward the normal, toward this line. The deflection is toward the line. So there are going to be no direct P wave from here up until here from which zone from 98 degrees to up until 144 up until 144 i cannot record p wave directly but i can record it indirectly it if it goes like hits the surface and return back these are not considered direct p waves these are direct p p is a direct P, C, P is a direct. P, K, P is a direct as well. Those are direct. And based on this information, people know that the outer core is made up of liquid. Another question, what do you think about S wave? What do you think about S wave? S wave, direct S wave. Would I be able to record it in this zone from 100? Oh, sorry, from 98 up until 180? No. You can't record S wave. The reason being, no S wave. There is no, as Aisha said. So S wave cannot be recorded. The reason being, S wave cannot travel in this zone. S wave cannot, there is no S wave here as a direct. But there could be like a mood conversion. Maybe an, a P wave hit this interface, a P wave, and a mood conversion generated then S wave. That's true. That's possible. But direct S wave are not there. They will not be recorded at all in this zone. And these two zones are called shadow zones. So we have P wave shadow zone and we have also S wave shadow zone. So P wave shadow zone is within this range, whereas S wave shadow zone is much larger. In these shadow zones, we might be able to record P and S, but they are not direct. So these are what we call seismic faces. Doctor? Yes. Can you please uh, explain and notifications about what mean direct and not direct? So direct, yes, thank, uh, I will explain once more what's a direct. So direct, uh, um, maybe I need to create, uh, let's see, a jam board, whiteboard, yes, start a new whiteboard. Hopefully you can see the what I'm sharing with you. So let's assume that this is the ear surface. I have a receiver a source here. This is a source. And this is a receiver somewhere here. If the energy travels like that, hits the surface and get recorded, that's not a direct. This is a direct. That's a direct. Whereas this one, one is not a direct, two is a direct. Maybe I need to uh, color them differently. Yeah, so this is the direct. 
That's not a direct. One went like that. Let me again go back. That's not a direct. Whereas this is a direct. That's a direct. Another thing, maybe this went like that. It went or started as a P wave, retained back as an S wave. That's not a direct S wave. This is a mood conversion. This is something which was converted from P to S. That's not a direct. So likewise, in the Earth interior, if I clear everything, uh, in the Earth interior, My, my drawing is not good, but anyway, this is a direct from source to receiver. Whereas this one is not a direct. It hits the surface retained back. That's not a direct. So in some zone from here, for example, up to here from 98, to one four four this is the zone what we call p wave shadow zone because no direct p wave will arrive because the p wave if it hits this interface it it deflects away and comes like that and maybe this is the last point it travels so within this zone, there is no direct P wave. Whereas there could be indirect like that. Or like that, one, two, three. This is P, 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 P. Is that clear? So that's how, yeah, that's what we call direct or indirect. And in seismic recording, usually we can see them. We can differentiate them. It's not easy task, yeah, but uh, seismologists can differentiate whether array is a direct or not direct. We need a lot of recording to make this judgment. We need a lot of stations, not one station, a lot. And you know that in uh, USA, every five kilometers, there is a station at least in USA. Uh, we have 20 stations, but in USA, every five kilometer, there is a seismic station. So this is the real, uh, somehow real uh, uh, phases of the Earth, or seismic waves um, propagating through the Earth. What we see, this is uh, the earthquake, and we assume that we are recording the energy at all these points where an arrow is pointing toward the earth. And this is what we call shadow zone, P-wave shadow zone. From 98 to 144, there is no direct P-wave. The direct P-wave stopped. So it's almost here, there is no direct P-wave. But we see PP, this is not a direct, we see a PP. This is not direct pp is faster than s direct it's arriving before so this is time and that's the angle the central angle that's the angle of uh, between uh, the receiver and the source so these are how much time it takes so the time it takes for the p wave to travel from a point like here and a distance of, um, let's assume 160 degrees away, it takes almost 20 minutes for the P wave, direct P wave, PKP. That's a PKP, P wind inside the core 
and return back. That's PKP. So this is S wave. We see some surface waves. Surface waves are where they are traveling, surface waves. They are traveling here. Uh, is it? We try to use the pen. It's traveling here, like on the surface. Surface wave will appear everywhere. They are very destructive. They are large in, in amplitude, uh, low in frequency, but they travel everywhere. So those are what you see here. Those are surface waves. So their amplitude is large, their frequency is low. This is similar to what you have seen um, here. So P wave, S wave, then surface waves. But we have many of them. We have many, many of them. So what is the interesting thing, the most interesting thing one can think of is that the separation between P and S, direct P and S. What happens to this separation? What's happening as we, as the epicentral angle increases? What we observe, we observe this interval is increasing as the epicentral angle increases. What is this separation exactly at the source? Zero. P and S will arrive at the same time, at exactly at the source. The separation between P and S will be largest the farther away. After 144, almost like here, we don't record direct S waves. There is no direct S waves. So this is the end of this chapter, seismology chapter. Uh, uh, I stop here. Uh, and yes. Uh, can you please repeat the last point? The last point I was saying that one of the interesting things, and it's actually a, a parameter we use to determine the location of the earth, earthquake, where an earthquake happened very important parameter this parameter is what the interval or the difference between s arrival time to p arrival time the difference in arrival time between s and p the larger this difference in arrival time it means the farther away is the station from the source So this arrival difference in arrival time between direct S and direct P is zero at where the source is, exactly where the earthquake happened. It's totally zero. The farther away, the larger this uh, interval gets, or that the difference in travel time between S arrival and P arrival, direct arrivals. And we use, there's gonna be a lab about it. We use this difference to determine where an earthquake happened. What is the distance from the, from the location we recorded an earthquake, where exactly an earthquake happened? Is that clear? So this is very interesting uh, parameter. The, the parameter is that, um, what is the, uh, the difference in travel time between S wave and P wave. So if, uh, if you don't have any further questions related to this chapter, we move to the next chapter. But uh, let's get some uh, uh, break, quick break before, before we move. So the next chapter should be completed within uh, um, next week. And the next chapter is very important chapter. It's about seismic reflection, seismic refraction. And it's very related to the chapter we just discussed. We are still discussing what we call the principle of Snell's law.
So I give you a few minutes uh, maybe to refresh, drink something and get back two or three minutes. So we'll discuss some other chapter called seismic refraction. Uh, uh, it's very interesting chapter. Seismic refraction as a technique is uh, used a lot in engineering application. The most common use application of seismic refraction is to determine what is the thickness of the bedrock. For example, in Al-Batna coast, we know that the topmost layer is unconsolidated layer. It's made up of soil. And it's very important sometimes if you want to construct some very important building to know how deep my foundation should be. The foundation should be uh, placed in a hard rock, in consolidated rock. So it's very essential to determine how much should I spend? How much should I dig? uh to determine where the foundation should be placed if you go back to youtube and search about the twin towers in malaysia have you heard of twin towers there are two similar towers connected by a bridge in malaysia uh, there is a good documentary about uh, uh, how they were built one of those towers actually during the construction time they stopped they stopped construction they stopped all the uh, the stage because because uh, one of those buildings were where was on an old river system was on top of unconsolidated layer so they stopped all the construction and they made the geophysical analysis uh, and they determined how deep is the bedrock later on they changed the plan they made some steels dig them very deep into the bedrock and nowadays even man whenever they want to build very important construction or building they have to do some geophysical analysis to determine if the slope is very stable uh, probably you are familiar with uh, the new road connecting between Masqat and uh, al There is a tunnel somewhere. The construction at tunnel site stopped many times because there were collapses of the rocks. There were some collapses of the rocks. So seismic refraction is very essential for such investigations. It can tell you how much uh, weight the rock can withstand. How much weight you can put on the rock? Whether the rock can withstand that rock or that that weight or not. How deep is the bedrock? And also have many other applications. However, in general, it have a lot of drawbacks. It has so many drawbacks. It, those drawbacks make make it almost unusable for oil exploration for oil exploration they don't use seismic refraction technique they use another technique called seismic reflection it's easier uh, more straightforward uh, better uh, deployed for seismic uh, for actually oil exploration so how seismic refraction techniques works what are the principles it based on this is the chapter we will uh, talk about uh, in uh, at least today and the next time. So we already discussed the Snell's law. Snell's law is based on this equation, sine of incident angle over the velocity of the wave, incident wave is equal to sine of uh, transmission angle divided the velocity of the respective ray, whether it's v vp or vs 
So if I'm interested to know the transmission angle of S wave, transmission angle of S wave, I need to plug in, in the denominator, the V of S wave. And this parameter is always constant. For spherical ears, we just plug in the R, R1, R2, R3, and so on, till the same parameter will be constant. The same parameter will be constant. We consider rays, and we already talked that the ray and wave front have orthogonal relationship. They are perpendicular to each other. And we discussed that the incident angle, if it has an angle, let's assume that the angle is 30 degrees and the velocity of the upper layer is lower than the velocity of the second layer, the ray will be deflected away. The transmission angle will be larger than the 30. And the amount of transmission angle is dependent on the velocity of the respective layers, upper layer and lower layer. We also know that whenever there is an oblique incident, not vertical incident, oblique only, <coughs> we will get also mood conversion. If this is a P wave arriving to the interface, it will be transmitted as P as well as S. It will be reflected back also as P and S. And uh, the final thing we discuss is that the P wave reflection angle is equal to the P wave trans uh, incident angle. So for today, we'll discuss what happens because we know that the rays will be traveling everywhere. So the rays actually, they travel everywhere. That's, uh, if this is the surface, the ray goes like that, goes like that. At one point, at one angle, the transmission angle will be parallel to the interface, will be parallel to the boundary. That's what we call critical refraction. It's very important. So critical in critical refraction, what is sine theta? What is, what is the value of sine theta in critical refraction? Who can tell me? Can you hear me, guys? What do you think is sine theta in the case of critical refraction? 90. Uh, sine 90, how much is it? Sine 90. Zero. Sine 90 is not zero, is one. Sine 90 is one, cos 90 is zero. So this value, all of it gonna be one. This value gonna be one, yes. Sine 90 is one, so this is 90 degrees, 90 to the normal. So I can simplify this equation as such then. Sine of I critical, that's a critical angle, V1 over V2. V1, which was here, it moved there, moved to the other side. I divided both sides by V1 to cancel out. So this is what I remained with. And if I ask you a question, how I can tell what's the critical angle? You only need to know the velocity of the respective layers to determine what's the critical angle. The critical is the, the definition of critical angle is that it's the angle at which the transmitted ray will par, will move parallel to the interface. The transmission angle is 90 degrees. Sine theta 2 will become 1. That's what we call critical refraction. And it's very important parameter or concept because those energy traveling in the second layer, these are what we will consider and discuss soon in the upcoming slides. We discussed already mood conversion. Mood conversion is, is basically what? 
Uh, whenever the energy is hitting the interface at an oblique angle, at an angle which is not zero, we will generate, a, uh, apart from P wave, if the incident wave is P wave, we'll generate also S waves. We'll generate reflection S and transmission S. So that's what we call mood conversion. So if this is a P wave, hitting the interface, I get what? I get transmitted P, transmitted S, uh, reflected P, reflected S. So if you ask me how I can calculate the Snell's law, how the relationship of Snell's law is, it's basically like that sine of theta i over VP1, that's VP, velocity of one, first layer, divided sine theta t, that's theta t, that's transmitted a p, so should be v p2, velocity in the second layer. It's also equal to sine pi r, that's pi r, trans, a reflected s, and I need to divide it by Vs1. That's the velocity of S wave in the first layer, which is also equal to sine theta, uh, not theta, not sure what they call this one. That's transmitted S wave divided by Vs2. These all are equal. So you, if you know one, you should be able to get the other. That's how what or what the Snell's law dictates. But we'll discuss about something called Huygens principles. And the Huygens principle is the law actually responsible about people hearing even around corners. And it's uh, also the principle which allows the energy to travel in every directions. So Huygens stated that every point, every point on the subsurface will act whenever there is an energy arriving to it, it will act at its so own source of energy. And the energy from all those points will interfere together. So they might interfere destructively or constructively. The constructive interference of these energy emitting from different sources will let the wave front propagate, move. So if there is, for example, um, um, a boundary and there is some points within the boundary, open points, the energy will travel a ray front arriving will move as if there were nothing. It will move as it were there were nothing. So that's how the energy travels. So again, some other example, an incident wave is arriving, hitting this interface. It reflects back as there was nothing because each point is transmitting its own energy. They will interfere either constructively or destructively at this line, at this stage, they are interfering constructively. So the energy moved one point forward. Whereas here, the energy travel in every direction. The energy at this scatter point will travel in every direction. And I can see this later on, we'll discuss that as what we call diffraction. This is where diffraction happens. So this is Huygens principle, and it's actually the principle which allows us to track, to use seismic refraction technique. So this is again a demonstration to what happens uh, whenever I try to send energies from one point to another point, how they travel? What's hygiene principles? 
So let's assume that this is a planar wave. It was here. It moved here. Then at a later time, it moved here. That's the wave front moving planar in planar manner. And at some point, it arrived at this point. In this point, those are the the uh, the points which are emitting the energy. Those red dots are the points actually which are emitting the energy. The energy will travel outward spherically from those points. So each point will emit its own energy. That's what we call. <coughs> That's what we call wavelets. Each one is emitting wavelets. So in these points, for example, here, they might interfere destructively, whereas at that apex, they will interfere constructively. And this is the phenomenon which lets the energy or the wave fronts to travel from one point, one place to another place based on the principle of hygiene. So here is the new wavefront. It traveled from here to here to here to here based on what we call wavelets. Are those the only wavelets? No. Everywhere there is a wavelet. Every point is acting as a new source of energy. As I said, behind the wavelets, the energy might interfere constructively. Uh, destructively. This is total destruction of the energy. So this is a trough. There is no energy here. This is a peak maximum energy at this wave front. And so on. It keeps moving and moving, expanding away and away. That's how the energy travels. So let's assume this is me and there is a kid trying to call me. Uh, ask me something but since he's not emitting um, what we call wavelets i cannot hear him unless if he, he emits wavelets i will be able to hear him and that's exactly how sound wave works sound waves even they can go, th go through a hole in the wall because they are following what we call hygiene principle my sounds will go through the through some hole in the wall and on the other side the energy starts expanding away and this is the reason someone would be able to hear me so let's assume these kids again sends uh, wavelets but he's understanding he got uh, bigger uh, he grow up, so uh, he understand now what are uh, what we call uh, wavelets. He tried to generate wavelets. So this are, this is how the wavelets travel. At this wave front, at this stage of the wave or planar wave, each point is emitting its own source. So this is how they travel. That's what we call wavelets. Uh, at this apex, they interfere constructively, letting the energy travel forward. So this is how they expand. I'm sitting behind this wall or this uh, barrier. I will still be able to hear him. And that's how seismic energy wave uh, works. We discussed these slides. I think we discussed these slides. I just explained these slides. Uh, so I can move forward. This is what I already discussed. Uh, so this is how Snell's law works, or uh, what we call a uh, um, critical angle. At one point, the energy will travel parallel to the interface. Here, the energy is traveling parallel to the interface. And uh, I can work out what's the critical angle by uh, knowing the velocity of the respective layers, V1 and V2. It's just arc sign of this ratio, V1 over V2. So 
how the energy travels in which layer the energy is traveling whenever the energy hits the interface as i said it will move parallel to the interface is it moving in layer one or layer two is the energy traveling in layer one or layer two what do you think at least from the from the figure itself yes that's true it's moving in the layer two it's parallel to the interface but it's moving in layer two so the interesting thing here is that the velocity of the second layer is larger than the velocity of the upper layer so at some distance i think this will travel farther away from array traveling in the first layer that's my belief because the velocity in the second layer is larger than the velocity in the first layer. So the wave fronts here, they are traveling with a relationship to the interface, which is orthogonal. They have 90 degrees. Whereas the wave front in the first layer, they travel normally without being distorted or changed so uh, the energy what happens to the energy if the energy hits if array hits an interface at the critical angle this is the critical angle the energy is traveling in the second layer parallel to the interface so before this angle we call subcritical before this angle or this distance this is the distance this is the angle critical distance is different than the critical angle distance is measured in meters whereas angles are measured in angles the thing we need to consider a lot and keep a focus on before the critical most of the energy will be transmitted to the deeper layers there is a lot of transmission before the critical angle after the critical angle most of the energy will be reflected back most of the energy after the critical will be reflected back so the things before the critical, we call them subcritical, below critical. The reflections after the critical, we call them supercritical reflections, or what we also call total internal, internal reflection, total internal reflection, because most of the energy will be reflected, reflected back after the critical angle. There are some animations I will play soon but uh, I hope that you can hear the sound at least. Can you hear the voice? Is the voice clear to you? Mm. Okay, uh, at least you can play it yourself uh, because uh, mm, I cannot play it. I So well, this is based on snail's law. So if this is slower, it will reflect away. So this is what we call critical. It's traveling in the fast layer. All the energy will be reflected in this case. And that's what we call supercritical. These are subcritical because most of the energy will be moving in the second layer. So 
So these are what we call critical. They will generate head waves. Why head waves? Because each point here is acting as a new source of energy following Huygens principle. So if you keep follow one of the rays, you'll see that this energy, head wave energy arrived earlier than the direct energy. That's a direct energy directly arriving from source to the receiver. So my recommendation is that you play these videos yourself. Uh, the, um, the PowerPoint slides are available in module. So this is again a continuation of the same animation. We assume that there is a source here, explosion. We have an energy traveling directly straight in a straight path, whereas this is a critical refraction. At some point at the Jufun, which is 80 or 80 meters away from the source, we find that the critically refracted energy arrives before the direct. Critically refracted energy arrives in these three geophones, which are located at 80, 90, 100 meter. They arrive earlier than the direct energy. The direct energy is the energy traveling straight from source to receiver. So this is um, the last animation. Fortunately, it's without uh, sound again. I'm having instead of just two layers, multiple layers. And the velocities is increasing, the velocity of each layer is increasing as we go deeper. So here the energy from, so at least for this one, the energy from uh, head waves from refraction arrived earlier than the direct. This is very important to understand because uh, that's what we will discuss in more detail uh, um, in, in the following week, probably. So my question here, I have an energy, a source emitting energy. Uh, there is an interface between two, these two mediums. And what I observe, I observe that there is a deflection. My question is, which layer do you think have a higher velocity, medium one or medium two? <clears throat> yeah, at least that's what I see from the animation. The energy is traveling faster compared to the energy here in the second layer. That's one interesting point. But the most important one is that uh, the, in, the, the angles, the rela relationship between these angles, this angle is larger than Theta one is larger than theta two. So it means the energy is deflecting toward the normal, which brings us to the conclusion that the medium two has a lower velocity than the medium one. So as some of you said that medium one has a larger velocity than medium two. So in general, whenever there is uh, a source of energy, we get three different types of arrivals, or the energy will travel in three different paths. One of them is direct, directly from the source to a receiver. That's the direct. One of them is the reflect, reflection. The blue colored ray is the reflection. And the final one is critical or refraction. It arrives to the interface at the critical angle and travels parallel to the interface, but moving in the second layer. The second layer has a higher velocity usually than the upper layers. So at some point, the energy from critical will arrive earlier than the direct energy. So what is the relationship? Why these things are important? 
This type of energy, the one you see blue, in blue color, reflection will study it in some other chapter. For this chapter, we will consider only refraction, how they travel and how we can use them to determine the Earth structure. In all the seismic techniques, either reflection or refraction, what is the most important things we need to bring or we need to determine are as such. First of all, the velocities of the layers. How many layers are there? And what is the thicknesses of these layers? So from next week onward, we'll discuss how we can determine the velocity and number of layers using seismic refraction technique. So the energy travels in different paths. It travels straight from source to receiver, or it hits an interface, get reflected back. That's the reflection technique. That's the technique we'll study in some later chapter. But for this chapter, we consider only the refracted ray, the energy which travels parallel to the interface. And it moves to the upper layers following hygiene's principle. How is that? Each point here is emitting energy. The energy is traveling forward. And at some points, they interfere constructively. So the energy travels like that. And that's what we call head waves. These are called head waves. So I believe I stop here and we'll discuss or let's let's just just discuss this slide <laughs> before we stop because this is quite interesting. So um, what observations I make? And what are the data I receive? There are two different things. So the ob field observations are the, the thing you see in the lower part. I have a source. The source is a hammer. And I have a lot of geophones. I have a lot of geophones. So these geophones will receive lose three different energies. We are only considering for the time being at least P wave. So here I'm considering only P wave direct. They're going to be also S wave, S wave reflection, S wave refraction, S wave direct as well as P wave direct. But let's only consider the P wave, not the S wave. So the energy travels straight away and the the direct energy will be shown as a linear line, a straight line. When the source and receiver are exactly at the same point, the direct ray will arrive to the receiver at zero time, exactly at very small time, because the source and receiver are on top of each other, like in here. So the direct ray always goes through the origin. What's the origin? This is the distance, and that's the time. So this source here, it will receive, this, sorry, receiver will receive an energy, will re receive a deflection, some, something like that. And again, another deflection. This first deflection is from the direct. The second deflection is from reflection. Reflection will arrive later because the energy went down, get reflected back, went up. So which one arrives first? Definitely the direct. The direct, that's the time scale, zero time. Time is increasing upward. So it arrives first. That's what we call direct. This is the direct. All of those geophones up until this point, 
direct energy is the first to arrive. And how I can determine the velocity of the first layer? I can find out what's the velocity of the first layer using the slope of the direct energy. 1 over V1 is the slope. Slope is basically what? Park, the difference in y-axis divided by the difference in the x-axis. x-axis is distance, y-axis is time. Time over distance is a reciprocal of velocity. So the slope is a reciprocal of velocity. You can work out what's velocity using um, the slope of the line. That's the first line. Whereas the energy start appearing as first energy after some distance. The energy from refracted will appear the first, first, that's the, the, that's the direct, which is the first. If I have a Jew phone here, somewhere here probably, at this distance, no energy yet, no energy, no energy. Up until here, after some time, I get some energy next is direct next is reflection my question is there any distance reflection is the first to arrive reflection can it arrive at any point earlier than other waves reflection no reflection is always later arrival reflection energy that's the refracted energy. So refracted, this refracted gives you the velocity of the second layer. How we can determine the thickness of the, the first layer? That's the topic of next lecture. Basically, we use these times, these intercept times. What time you see here, this can be used to determine what's the thickness of the layer of first layer, second layer. So this is what we do in the field. That's the data we receive. These are the data we receive. And we try to use this data to determine what are uh, the velocities of the layers and thicknesses of those layers. So I stop here. My recommendation, go through the slides, read them. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't get time last week to upload uh, the, la, the previous video, but I uploaded it today. I have it. Uh, unfortunately, the internet is very slow back home, so I try to upload it today. So any questions so far? We have five minutes left. Do you have any questions to what we have studied today? You don't have questions, I call it uh, the end of today's lecture. Goodbye. So first of all, let me stop recording.